What's going on everybody? It's Patrick here and today I'm going to be answering a question that I often get but I usually just answer on an individual basis or one-on-one -on -one. and I haven't really addressed this in a video yet so I figured this would be actually the best way to get this information out there in case you were looking for it. So today we're going to be talking about my very weird and very impractical uh, autismo fingerings. So what you just heard me playing in the beginning of the video was, of course, the end of the second half of the last chorus of my solo on Emmett Cohen's After You've Gone. And I wanted to play that just to give you an example, at least if you I don't know if you can see my fingerings, kind of how I navigate through that. And I'm actually going to be telling you how I played that phrase and a couple of other phrases that I play by going through each and every one of my altissimo fingerings to kind of give you a hint as to how I get through the instrument when it goes up to that high register. So the reason why I say my fingerings are weird and impractical is because, you know, most saxophone players have a very regimented and clear way of playing altissimo fingerings, some of which I know, but most of them I actually kind of just taught myself. I don't really have a, a studied way of playing altissimo beyond things that I kind of gathered from other people and things that I thought they were doing, so I kind of made up my own stuff. And so, <laughs> word of caution, when you see some of these fingerings, just be wary that there's going to be a lot of very personal things that I'm doing. Like I said, I will also explain, but most of these fingerings are very custom to me and the way I play. So as you try them, it's okay if, you, if they don't come out. I'm just, this video is just here to explain what I'm doing and showing them to you. That's basically all I'm doing. But before we jump into the video, of course, I got to take a moment to talk about this beautiful horn that I'm playing right now that you should also be taking a look at yourself. This is, of course, the John Ledbetter, J.L. Woodwind. Artist Edition New York Signature Cognac Lacquer Alto Saxophone, all the way from New York. And if you want to get your hands on one of these, you can actually go to jlwoodwindrepair.com and navigate over to the saxophones, find the altos, and go ahead and hit the New York Signature Artist Edition Alto Saxophone. And when you go to the checkout, all you got to do is put in promotion code PBART to get $150 off of your next saxophone purchase. So if you want to get your hands on one of these things, now's the time, y'all. Holiday season's coming up. All right, so let's talk about some of these fingerings because <laughs> uh, this is about to be a wild ride. So usually when people talk about altissimo, there's maybe one of two places you might start. You might say that the upper tessitura, as in the high register of the alto, kind of ends at F, like either fork F or side F. And so naturally you might think that altissimo could start at F sharp. Well, some altos and most modern saxophones, I guess, all have a high F sharp key. Mine does not have one because I asked them to remove it. I prefer it without. There's nothing wrong with it. If you prefer it, you have it. My my old Yamaha 62 had for 12 years had a high F sharp key. But either way, it doesn't matter. This is just my personal preference. So if your horn doesn't start, uh, doesn't come with an F sharp key, a high F sharp key natively, then your altissimo probably does start on F sharp. But if you do have a high F sharp, then maybe your altissimo starts on G. Either way, I'm going to, for the purposes of this video, I'm going to talk as if you don't have a high F sharp key. One, because sometimes a high F sharp key is not exactly as ergonomic for fast passages. It's really good for trilling between F, but you can also trill between F and F sharp with fork F and a nice side B flat to make an F sharp come out. So why don't we go ahead and start with high F sharp. Actually, I also should preface that all of these fingerings that I'm talking about are exclusively for alto. Well, um, <laughs> with the exception of a few fingerings that are in the lower altissimo, like F, F sharp, G maybe, um, some of those fingerings can work on tenor, but I've experimented with some of those fingerings and they don't always tend to work across the board. So uh, just as a, as discreet, at your discretion, you know, try these and take that into account. But these are mostly for alto. So the way I normally play F sharp is with one of two options. And the primary option that I use is starts with, of course, front F. I use front F or fork F, depending on how you call it, which is where you slide your finger, your index finger from one up to that front high F key with two. And then I play side B flat. Now, this fingering is actually pretty common. I, I expect most people probably know this finger by now. You might already use it, but just want to say it just in, just in case. This is the finger I normally use, and I like going from f to f sharp um up to other altissimo fingerings that i use um but that one's really good for trilling um sometimes however and when i get into g you'll understand what i mean sometimes i also will instead of playing high f i'll play i'll start off high f and then move my finger up to the bis key and then that'll also be f sharp 
So this will be very handy for when I talk about my fingerings for G because that's when things get kind of weird. But as of right now, those are the two main fingers I use for F sharp. And I'll play them for you right now so you can see how they sound. So that is front F with side B flat. And this is the front F, the fork, but just with the top finger and sliding my second finger up to the bis key. It sounds like this. So if I play both of them back to back, they sound like this. So you can also do some kind of weird stuff if you really choose to, if you want to go back and forth. Some, sometimes, very rarely, I don't do this that much, but if I'm feeling inventive, I might go back and forth between the two fingerings like this. <laughs> it's kind of, I don't know, it's funny. You know, explore sounds. That's what you should do when you're playing, uh, playing music, so... But those are my F sharp fingerings. So now let's talk about G. So my G fingerings, um, the first G fingering I ever used, um, it's kind of, I'll, I'll keep this story short. First G finger I ever used was just the fork. Now, again, if I'm like, you know, 13, 14 years old and I'm just kind of playing the saxophone, I'm like, I wonder what notes are up here. And I go up to this. Well, that's logical. And that's actually the finger I use on tenor, but that doesn't quite work on alto because it tends to be a little too sharp as it, sounds like this it's almost like a quarter step right it's like in between g and g sharp so eventually as i started exploring and i told you that i found my f sharp fingering right well because i found out this was also f sharp i decided huh i wonder what happens if i play a uh, side b flat with the bis b flat and i ended up getting this whoa <laughs> so then I ended up balancing that out later on. I learned to balance that fingering out by putting one in the right hand. So this primary G finger, believe it or not, this is my primary fingering for G in both fast and slow applications. Because for me, this is actually the most balanced G fingering that I've learned for the way that I normally play. And it's very versatile. So just so you can tell, even, even though it's on the screen, just so you know, it is the top front F, with the bis key and then side B flat, right? I'm not sure if you can see that, but side B flat. And then I'll press uh, uh, one in the right hand. So I've had people talk to me saying, hey, doesn't this F, the, the F normally cover the whole of this anyway? Well, yeah, it does cover the B flat, but the reason why I keep it there is so that I can easily go back and forth between G and F sharp. Now you're starting to see how I do that. So if I can trill from F to F sharp with the fork fingering in the side B flat, well, I can trill between G and F sharp with that weird fingering I have, like this. So with careful intonation, I mean, I'm probably a little sharp right now, but with careful intonation and good embouchure, you can trill back and forth between F sharp and, and, uh, and G really easily like that. So that's my normal G fingering. Um, sometimes I use the accepted G fingering as well, which is one, three, one, three. And I know a lot of people like using that fingering, which ends up getting that kind of popped out sound, that kind of really aggressive, kind of uh, classic smooth jazz, uh, G sound, pop sack sound, or even kind of more rough, like really almost Pharaoh Sanders, John Coltrane type of uh, powerful sound, which is like this. Sometimes you can kind of scoop into it, right? So I like that fingering as well. And you might be wondering like why two different altissimo fingerings to get the same note? Well, it's actually more than just ergonomics. I like the sound of both of the notes. So if I want a smoother sound that I want to use to transition between lines, I'll play that first weird fingering, which is the uh, bis key and side B flat G fingering like this. And I like that. And it, it's, I can also do this. So that allows me to smoothly transition between passages in a way that this fingering kind of is a little clunky to do that. Cause then I have to do some weird moving, you know, jumping around with my fingers to get stuff really fast. So I actually have worked this out and this is the fingering I've been primarily using for G 
since I was in high school. And, you know, ever since then, it's been my main G fingering. Let's move on to G sharp. <laughs> so G sharp is another weird one. Um, this is probably the most unstable altissimo note, I think, in general, regardless of what fingering you use. It's very finicky for some reason. I don't know why. I'm not a sax tech expert. But I've learned, again, from the same logic of when I first discovered that this note with like fork f without the, the 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 middle finger could create a note that sounded like g also notice that it can also be higher as well so that natural kind of ear movement to listening to something sharp allowed me to oh what if i pressed side b flat and then i got the main g sharp fingering that i use to this day now <laughs> this fingering is a little hard because if you play altissimo in the traditional way, you might not be able to get this fi this fingering out. So this has to do with a lot of me voicing the note in a certain way with a certain tongue position kind of raised <laughs> to create almost like a pinhole so that the air goes through effortlessly to hit the note. <laughs> so that's my main fingering for G sharp. But I also use uh, one and three by itself which can also work. Sometimes that's a cleaner passage if you're playing in B major, for example, and you wanna do like a, a arpeggio. If I do a major seven arpeggio in B concert major, then my G sharp, I'll use, to, to go back and forth between G sharp and G, I'll do the one, three, one, three, and then back to the one, three by itself, like that. You know? You know, that kind of vibe, so. And I use that fingering quite a lot. But usually, if I'm really playing like B minor or B blues or something like that, this is probably my favorite altissimo fingering to use, which is just one at the top, just fork and side B flat. Because that one allows me to take advantage of the fact that it's really delicate and can crack to get a really easy growl crack. I don't know, I wouldn't say easy, but for me, it's easy because I'm making use of the, un, the the instability of the note in order to manipulate a more rough, edgy, um, really blues-drenched sound, which is what I like doing on that fingering. So, that's what I learned how to do, and that's why I came up with my, G, my G-sharp fingering, so that's that. All right, so this next fingering is something everyone knows. I'm not going to spend too much time on it. It's basically just two and three. And two and three is for A. So um, my, con my not concert A, sorry, sa saxophone A, which is a, this is a fingering that you can use both on alto and tenor and Barry, I think. I haven't really experimented too much with Barry Altissimo, but soprano, it also works too. It's a very common A fingering. You can balance it out with one, two, three, and... Um, uh, e flat in the right hand as well but for me sometimes if i'm just playing fast i'll just play two and three very simple um very standard across the board nothing too special about it but i'll also show you how it sounds when you can balance it out with uh, the and when i say balance it out i mean uh, intonation but balancing it out with the right hand just makes it more stable it's easier to play So that's my A fingering. You can use it for a lot of different applications. It's, it's like right in the center of the altissimo, like right between F sharp and like, you know, high uh, uh, high C sharp and F, which we'll get to later. But that's just my A fingering. I like that fingering a lot and it's very versatile for minor, major, uh, mixolydian, all types of things like that, right? And then this is one of those weird instances where I might switch back and forth between uh, scooping my fingers, right? So if I want to go from between C and G, uh, you know, I could do one of two things. But my primary thing is doing the fast G fingering that I do. So I'll, I'll slide. It's weird, but that's my A fingering. Next is a funny story about uh, A sharp or B flat. So I used to play B flat just by overblowing open C sharp. I would just straight up, that's what I used to do. Until I discovered, again, another very common fingering, which is just um, uh, three, and then one, two, three, and E flat. It's a very balanced, easy to pop out uh, B flat altissimo note. 
And that's what I've been using for since at least college, I guess now. And this is what it sounds like. It's a heck of a lot easier than the C sharp overblown thing. But, you know, sometimes every now and then I haven't found myself doing it since then. But sometimes if I want to be fast, I can trill between my uh, high B fingering, which I'll tell you later, and uh, the, B, the false B flat overblown C sharp fingering. But usually I just like doing three and then one, two, three. That's easy. And of course, if you just let go of one, two, three, you can trill very easily between B flat and A, which is what I normally do. And that's my fingering for a B flat. All right, so before we get to the most interesting part of the video to me, um, which is probably the video most of you've been waiting for, um, I want to take a moment to address the elephant in the room. Yes, this is a new green Silas mouthpiece. I'll be talking about this later, but basically the update is that I've been really liking Silas mouthpieces and so much that, you know, I had them make another one for me. So this one's feeling pretty nice. There might be some new updates on the horizon, but until that happens, stay tuned. Please be patient. I really appreciate it. Um, <laughs> there's some really exciting things on the horizon that I can't wait to share with you. But for right now, yeah, this is a new... Uh, green Styles mouthpiece that actually is very, very, very similar to what my Meyer was. And you probably might be able to tell, but it's kind of like Meyer Plus. So that's the vibe that this mouthpiece gives me. And um, yeah, I can't wait to share it with you. But for right now, let's get on with the video. All right, now we're at the most interesting part of the video. The part of the video that makes absolutely no sense. Uh, <laughs> well, maybe it does make some sense, but... For me, this is the part I always get comments about. Matter of fact, the reason why I wanted to make this video besides having this question a lot was me thinking about constantly how uh, a good friend of mine, Savon Pentecott, an incredible, incredible saxophonist, um, plays with everyone, and you should go check him out if you don't already know him already. Um, but one day we were playing with, uh, with John Batiste. This might have been maybe four or five, maybe six years ago, I'm not sure. But one day we were practicing as, you know, we normally do practice in the room and he come up to me and he said something like, hey, why don't your altissimo fingers, fingerings uh, pop out? And I'm just like, I don't know, what do you mean? And then he was talking about why don't I have like very specific fingerings for some of the notes I play? Well, believe it or not, he was talking about <laughs> my notes above high B flat. So today we're gonna be, well now we're gonna be talking about my notes above the upper register of the altissimo, starting with my high B fingering, which is an overblown D. Yes, that's right. This is my altissimo fingering for D. No special combination, one, three, two, flat, seven over G sharp, whatever kind of fingering combination. No, it's just D. That's it. <laughs> and as a matter of fact, all of my fingerings above this point until we start getting up to the really high notes are just overblown uh, uh, palm keys. And it's kind of a problem because <laughs> well, it's not a problem for me, but it's a problem for when I teach because as a result, it's a little hard for me to convey like, hey, you have to find this voicing, find this fingering, um, and it doesn't pop out. However, it does teach you some good lessons, I guess. It teaches you good lessons about voicing, about tongue position, about control, and the reason why I figured this fingering out is because I was really into Gerald Albright when I was 15. Um, Gotta admit, I hate to admit this, but all of us my age and older have done it. Uh, you know, when I was downloading off of LimeWire, you know, because this is the only way I knew to uh, get music at a certain point, I was typing in Gerald Albright, and I, I found a recording of Georgia on my mind. I found two recordings, one from New Beginnings and a live one. That live recording changed my life. From that moment on, I was like, oh, man, this is different, because I never heard anybody play altissimo like that on the on the alto. Normally, you know, I heard, I heard Michael Brecker, I heard Train, whatever, you know, I heard some tenor altissimo but that was like blowing my mind um and so i heard him play this ending to georgia on my mind and <laughs> i'll i'll get into the ending more once i start getting it once i talk about my high d fingering but for right now basically when i was trying to play all those notes that he would play i had no idea i was hearing the stuff before i knew what fingerings to use so i had to come up with my own way uh to get these fingers out because there's nobody else going to teach me i didn't have any private lessons so I discovered that if I overblow all of the palm keys, I can get a note above. So I'm going to kind of streamline these these uh, next, I think, three or four notes um, almost in a row. Uh, so I'm going to combine this into one section so that you can uh, uh, kind of... Because the, the, the general philosophy is the same. So anyway, B, C, C sharp, D, they're all on the palm keys. So you get them by pressing D... D sharp, E, and F. 
So <laughs> all of my altissimo fingerings from D to from B to D sound like this. So those are those are the fingerings for all of them. Um, <laughs> you can do like funny stuff like that. Um, but the reason why I like these fingerings a lot is because even though they don't pop out, they're very simple and intuitive because guess what? You already know how to play the palm keys. So if you already know how to play the palm keys, you already know how to play high D, uh, sorry, high B, high C, high C sharp, and high F. I mean, high D. You can play all of those fingerings <laughs> just the same. No new fingerings required. It's all there. And those are my fingerings for <laughs> those notes. Yeah, real quick, like I said, I was talking about high D, and the line that I'm talking about from the Jerry Albright recording, it was something like this. I don't remember exactly what the first part of it, but he kind of played the blues going down, and it was like this. Then this. And I went, ah! <laughs> My mind was blown. My little 50 year old mind was blown. I was like, what? And so I know a lot of y'all might have heard that recording, but if you haven't, check that out, man. It's unbelievable. Um, that was my inspiration for Altissimo, was basically him. So after that, everything was history. That, <laughs> that, that's why I wanted to talk about that. But that's kind of how I came to my palm keys, because I was like, I don't know what he's doing, but I want to do it now. And I just figured that out for myself. And yeah, that was that. All right, so now we're going to talk about the most recent development in my Altissimo fingerings, which is something that I kind of only came to maybe eight years ago, like right after college. Um, and we're talking about high D sharp, high E, because very rarely can I play up to high F. I kind of, I kind of lip up to high F, but basically right now we're going to be talking about high, uh, high D sharp and high E. So before I discovered this next fingering, the way I would normally do D sharp is I would just kind of lift up D with that high F key on the side. But more recently I made a discovery that in the same way that I could play the fork F, right? Fork F without the two, I could overblow a fork F with the side C key, my first side C fingering for Altissimo and get a high D sharp pretty reliably. And so this is what it would sound like. And that kind of surprised me how easy it was to pop out. So that's kind of what I've been doing for a high D sharp. And then for E, E was actually, I first started off as an overblown uh, uh, A, and that's basically what I still use to this day. But in order to get that, I balance it out with the same A fingering that I used to balance it out, which is two, three, one, two, three, and E flat. And that gives me a more balanced and more consistent E. And again, I kind of have to squeeze that out sometimes, so until I find another one, that might be the limit, because <laughs> otherwise, for high F, I just do the same thing I do for for B flat and I just kind of overblow that. Um, it's not very efficient, but it's consistent. <laughs> so that's what I use for for those fingerings. And that's basically the upper limit until I find anything else. But at a certain point, you know, you kind of get diminishing returns and it starts to get really squeaky. So usually that part of Altissimo is just for expression. So yeah, that's it, everybody. Thanks so much for watching this video. Um, those are all my altissimo fingerings. And this video went a little longer than I planned it. I'm sorry about that. But hopefully the pacing and the timestamps made it easy to find the place that you wanted to look for if you're looking for a specific note in mind. Uh, but other than that, that's what I have to give to you. And if you want to hear about any other of my techniques that I do on my saxophone, let me know in the comments below because... I don't, I'm not, a, I'm, again, I'm not a gearhead. I'm not really a tech head. A lot of stuff I do was just stuff I kind of just taught myself. So if there's anything else that's weird that you notice I do that you want me to explain, please tell me in the comments because I think it would make some very interesting videos, um, especially for me because it helps me to kind of hone in like, what am I actually doing? I have no idea. <laughs> so it, this video was a really good way for me to kind of just uh, zoom out and look at what's happening and then zoom back in to tell you exactly what I'm doing. So Really appreciated that, and I'll appreciate any other ideas, comments, even about this video or any other videos that you have for me, because I will read them, so thank you.
Oh, I forgot. I should have mentioned this at the beginning of the video. But in case you haven't heard by now, we have a new Discord, the Patrick Bartley Jazz Topia. And that link can be found in the description below. It's a place for anybody if you're into jazz as a student or as a professional, or if you're just enthusiastic about the music, if you're a saxophone player, if you're a vocalist, if you're a keyboard, any instrument, whatever, you want to talk about the music in a very supportive community, you can go ahead and hit that link below to join the community. And also, my links for social media, such as Twitter, Instagram, all that stuff are in the bottom. Uh, and of course, YouTube. If this is your first time watching, please consider liking and subscribing and hitting that bell because you can stay notified for whenever I put up a new video and you can give your input for any videos that you want to see from me as well. But yeah, that's it. We back. We're trying to do more content. So give us your ideas. I really want to know more what you want to see. But until then, thank you so much for watching the video and take care, y'all. I'll see y'all later.